Hi guys, I've got some great news. As you can see, I managed to survive the horrid man flu epidemic of 2017 and I'm now back to 100%. That combined with the fact that today is Friday, of course, means lots of DIY sailboat refit fun right here aboard Athena. This weekend, if everything goes according to plan, I'll continue working on the new locker above the chat table. I'll also install the new stove in the galley and get started preparing to rewire all of the AC. Even though spring is officially here and it was a balmy 12 degrees yesterday, today the temperature has dropped back down to 4 and it is quite windy. I've got the kerosene heater on down below, so why don't we head down and take a look at the progress I've made. As you can see, the boat is a big mess down below and I desperately need to do a bit of tidying up. If I don't tidy up the boat, I'll just end up spending most of the weekend searching for tools and stuff I need just like I did last weekend. In here in the port side aft cabin, there has been a little bit of progress. I mentioned in the last video that I was considering moving the AC panels from this location to this location. I asked you guys what you thought I should do, and a few days back I checked the vote, and it was split right down the middle. There's no doubt in my mind that having the AC panels over here right next to the DC panels would look awesome. But moving the panels made a lot of sense in regards to optimizing the amount of space available here at the nav station. And also cable management would be a little bit easier if I moved the panels. So yesterday using my oscillating tool, I cut two big gaping holes in this locker. And this is what it's roughly going to look like with the panels in place. Now bear in mind they aren't screwed in yet, so they're a bit crooked, but I'm sure you get the idea. Just in case you're wondering, the hinge support for the screen that sits here and the screen itself easily clears the two panels, so I think this is going to work out great. You might be able to tell that I've painted the inside of this locker. Before I did that, the locker looked a little bit something like this. Yeah. It was pretty crusty, and I want to have this locker turn into a technical locker, so there will be all kinds of gizmos and wires in here, and I want to have it looking as neat as possible. I'm even considering cramming the charger and the inverter and possibly the isolation transformer in here, but uh, yeah, we'll uh, have a look at that later today and see if that's at all possible to do. Because of the way this locker is constructed, there's not really enough room for the insulating covers I've picked up. So I might end up building my own little box to cover these up so that your fingers don't get in contact with the angry pixies. I've also managed to finish painting these two pieces of the locker. So why don't I go ahead and put these up? That way there's a little bit less of a mess to take care of in here in the saloon. I think I might have said I was done painting these two pieces here, which is not completely accurate. What I meant to say was I'm done painting the surfaces I'll need to paint before putting them up. I'm not going to glue these pieces in place, I'll just use screws, and that's because none of this is set in stone. I might very well change my mind about the setup here in the nav station in two or ten years, and it would be kind of nice to have these be easily removable. But uh, this feels very sturdy. And yes, it is totally by design that the bottom of the two holes here look exactly like a mouse hole from a Tom and Jerry cartoon. I put up the last of the two pieces here and again, everything feels quite sturdy. Over the coming week, I'll continue painting this and hopefully next weekend, I'll be able to show you the finished result. There's something a little bit odd that I wanna show you and it's related to this piece that goes right here. See this gap over here? Something mustn't have been sitting right last weekend when I cut this piece here, but that's okay. I've got plenty of plywood and I'll just cut a new one of these. You guys have already seen me cut that piece of plywood twice and I think that's enough. So I'll cut the third one later today off camera. I mentioned in the beginning of this video preparing to rewire the AC and I've got everything I need except for one teeny tiny thing and that's the cable I need. 
So far this is the best cable I've been able to find. And it's a really nice cable. It's halogen free, it's tinned, it's multi-stranded. In short, it's a really nice cable that far exceeds all of the requirements put forth by ISO 13297. It's perfect, except for two things. The first is the color of the cable. As you can see, the outer insulation is black. Now, I don't believe I'm not allowed to use black, but it would be kind of nice to have a different color than red, black, and green and yellow, because those colors are going to get used for other stuff here aboard the boat. Now, before you comment, if you're located in the US, please bear in mind that we've got a different color coding over here than you guys do. The second thing is the fact that I can only find somewhere where I can purchase the 2.5 square millimeter version of this cable. That's somewhere in between a 12 and a 14 gauge wire. And this is for AC, so that would be overkill. 1.5 square millimeters would be perfectly fine to use. I don't mind spending a little bit more money to get a good quality cable, but because of the two reasons I've just mentioned, I think I'll keep looking around just a little bit longer. If any of you guys know of a good quality, halogen-free, tinned, multi-stranded cable that I could use, then please go ahead and leave a comment down below. Before I get flooded with comments, I better point out that I am aware that I'm not required to use a tinned cable. But given the fact that I'll only need about 50 meters of cable here aboard Athena, it's not going to be crazy expensive for me to opt for a slightly better cable. And no matter how you slice it, a tin cable is going to be more corrosion resistant than an untinned cable. Having said that, I know plenty of boats with raw copper wiring, even brand new boats. So yeah, this is just my choice. I better get busy tidying up and preparing for tomorrow where I'm going to shoot the bulk of this video. So uh, yeah, unless I come across anything super interesting while tidying up, I think I'll save you that experience. Good morning guys! It is Saturday morning. Yesterday I finished tidying up the boat and uh, you might be able to see the remnants of that here behind me. I also took care of a little bit more painting in the portside aft cabin and I got some prep work out of the way. Some of that prep work had to do with what's inside of this big box. If you've seen some of my previous videos, you might be able to guess what's inside of this. If not, this is the new stove for the galley. Oh, so shiny. Because I spent a better part of the day yesterday tidying up the boat, I now know exactly where to go to find a knife. I know it still looks a little bit chaotic out here in the forward cabin, but I know where everything is and that makes life so much easier. There might be a clever way to get this out of its box, but I can't figure it out, so I'll just use brute force. This stove is manufactured by a French company called Eno, and the model is called Open Sea. Now, the interesting thing about Eno is that I believe they also manufacture the uh, Force 10 stoves nowadays. But yeah, this looks pretty nice. In a later video, once I've got the stove hooked up to some propane, I'll take a much more in-depth look at this model and do a few tests. For today, all I want to do is to get it mounted in the galley. Before I start locking this thing around to figure out where to install it, I might as well just remove everything that's removable. The stove is not super heavy. I think it's somewhere in between 25 and 27 kilos. But still, it's a little bit unhandy to move around. I found the manual online yesterday, and that's what this little drawing up here is about. But uh, let's get back to that a little later on. Now let's see what's inside of this little 
plastic bag here because this looks an awfully lot like some kind of manual. Yeah, that's that's a manual. That's a safety sticker, contact info, warranty card, and for the gimbal mount. This is kind of interesting. This manual claims that the stove with the gimbal mounts is 51.7 centimeters wide, but the manual I found online yesterday claimed that the stove was 52.1 centimeters wide with the gimbal mounts. But why don't I start out by figuring out exactly how wide the area the stove is gonna sit in is. I've got one of these laser measuring doohickeys here and they don't claim great accuracy on these so let's just grab two measurements and compare those. 53.6. Now let's try this the old fashioned way. So that is at 30.6. The little stir stick I've used is 23 centimeters. So that's 30.6 plus 23, that's 53.6. It's kind of cool that this little thing got it right, but as you could see, it was kind of flickering in between 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. So yeah, not super accurate. Long story short, I've now got a measurement I can work with and depending on how wide the stove is, and I'll measure that in just a few seconds, I'll either need to come up with a spacer on each side of the stove that's 95 millimeters or 75 millimeters. So it looks like the gimbal mounts add about 7 millimeters to each side of the stove. And it looks like the stove itself is 50.5 four centimeters wide. The measurements I've grabbed match the measurements in the printed manual within a millimeter. That's great. And it also means I now know I need to come up with a spacer that's 9.5 millimeters thick. I've got plywood here aboard the boat that's six millimeters wide and I've got some that is 12 millimeters wide. Now none of that is gonna give me 9.5 millimeters. So it looks like my tiny trim router will get yet another flogging. I've come up with a shape I think will work well for the spacers, so now it's just gonna be a matter of removing a little bit of material. I would like to point out that the boat was nice and clean this morning because I spent about half an hour vacuuming everything yesterday. Yeah. That is perfect. There we go, two completely evenly sized spacers. I'll of course beautify these a bit before doing the final installation. And by that, I mean I'll round over the edges, paint them, make them look nice. But for today, it's all about just getting the stove up there. I need something to secure my beautiful spacers and also the gimbal mounts to the boat. So I'll just pop up to the hardware store. I couldn't do this yesterday because of course I needed to figure out how thick these spacers would be. Nuts and bolts in hand. Now let's see if I can figure out where to mount the stove. From the center of this to the very top of the stove, it looks like it's about eight centimeters. And as far as the distance from this to the gimbal mount, I think this looks about right. And of course this will go on the outside somewhere. And if I measure that, I think that comes out to about 18 centimeters. 18 centimeters. That means the center of the gimbal mount will go somewhere right around here. That means when I mount the stove, it's gonna look roughly like this. Right now it's just blocked up on some cardboard boxes and these were just the only thing I had that came close. So it'll actually be about a centimeter higher, but yeah, you get the idea. I've lined up each of the gimbal mounts and marked their position on the masking tape. So now it's just a matter of drilling some holes, AKA the terrifying part.
I don't have a center punch here about the boat, but what I do have is a screw and a hammer. And just like that, the first mount is on. I'm just gonna loosely secure this with a couple of bolts because remember, all of this is gonna come apart again because I wanna beautify these spaces once I'm completely sure that they're the correct size. I've removed the sink that was right here just to avoid any kind of nasty surprises. <laughs> Both of the mounts are in. Now let's see if the stove fits. Yep, perfect. I've put the countertop back on and some of the cheek molding there, I've just taped that in place so that you guys could get an idea of what this is going to look like. I think that looks pretty dang spiffy. Now this isn't screwed in place yet. The old holes just lined up for some reason, but as you can see, it doesn't interfere with the stove. A liverbot friend from the marina just stopped by and that was very fortunate because removing this thing is a two-man job because of the way it locks in. Now, he was here because we are planning on doing a little modification to the stove back here. For whatever reason, Eno hasn't covered this bit up with some stainless steel. And the thing is, this stove is going to get pretty nasty back here after a couple of years. So my liverboard friend and I are considering building a small stainless steel enclosure to cover this up. So there'll still be some ventilation, but just so that this would be covered up and it would be easier to clean. If we come up with a good solution to covering up this bit here, I'll be sure to show you in a later video. For now, it was great he stopped by because I was able to remove the stove and now I can remove the mounts here so that I can start working on them. I figure if I round over the edges here, that'll make this thing look a lot nicer than just sand it and paint it and it'll be perfect. I've screwed the spacer to a larger piece of plywood so that I can keep my fingers away from my trim router. Yep, once I've got a few coats of paint on here, these will look like a million bucks. And now that I've got the paint out, I better apply the next coat to the locker above the chat table. Not a lot has changed in here since yesterday, but a couple of more coats on this and it'll look awesome. I've just noticed something I think I forgot to mention yesterday. What I did mention yesterday was the fact that I was considering moving the inverter and the charger and possibly the isolation transformer into this locker. Well, I made these templates yesterday. This is a template of the inverter and there's a template of the charger down here, but I think it's gonna be out of frame. It's about 20 centimeters below the inverter. And these are only gonna protrude about this far out into the locker. So yeah. This could work. What's not gonna work is having the isolation transformer in there. There just is not enough room. Now you can see the charger and it would be awesome to have this locker as a technical locker because it's right next to the nav station and it's right next to all of the AC. So yeah, I think this could work out very well. My plan is to have all of the AC stuff coming down over here and then all of the DC stuff coming down over here. And yes, I will enlarge that hole. And there will be more than 10 centimeters of separation in there, which is required. Or, well, I think I might also put in some sort of physical barrier, but I think this will make an excellent technical logger. I will have to mount all of the electronic doohickeys I'll have here aboard the boat somewhere and having them right next to the nav station would be kind of nice. I'm thinking of the AIS transponder, the AIS splitter, the iCommunicate, the ladder panda, other enemy A stuff, a whole heap of things, right? And having them close to the nav station means less wiring, which is always nice. Now I will have to improve ventilation in this locker quite a bit, but that shouldn't be too hard to do. I am slowly but surely running out of daylight and I've got some other plans tomorrow. So the last thing I want to mention in this video is what's inside of this.
you might be kind of disappointed because these things are just regular old 12 volt sockets. A while back, I got a few comments suggesting that I should put some USB outlets here in the nav station to charge stuff. And I think that's an awesome idea, but I think it might make more sense to go with a couple of these instead. My plan is to have a bunch of these regular old fashioned 12 volt sockets throughout the boat and then pop in some of those adapter thingies, you know, 12 volt to USB. You use them in your car, for instance, to charge your phone or tablet, stuff like that. And the reason I'm doing that instead of mounting regular USB outlets, well, there are three reasons actually. For one, it's a lot easier to pull out the guts of this and just pop in a new USB adapter if it dies on you. And secondly, it seems like over the last five or 10 years, there's been a steadily increase in the amount of amps required to charge stuff like a phone or a tablet. And I think that trend might continue and it would be easy just to pop out that adapter and put in a new one. And thirdly, it also seems like we're just about ready to make the switch to USB-C. And again, it would be easy just to pop in a USB-C adapter. So funnily enough, these old fashioned sockets actually seem more future proof than putting up USB sockets. Let me know down in the uh, comments if you think I've completely gone off the rail with this uh, USB socket idea. Tomorrow, like I mentioned, I've got some other plans and those other plans are actually to get started shooting another video. In about a week and a half, I'll leave and go to New York City for about a week. And while I'm there, I'm not going to be able to shoot or edit any kind of video. So I figured if I could shoot a little bit of video tomorrow and then maybe a little bit of video next Sunday, perhaps I can clump that together and form some kind of video that's worth watching. That way I can stick to my regular schedule of publishing a video every Sunday. Well guys, that is going to be it for this video. As always, feel free to leave a comment down below and don't forget, if you've enjoyed this video, hit that like button. See you!